And today we look at living systems and spirals of hope. We'll go back to Paul Crafell a little bit and see what Paul has to say. One of the things that I've learned about systems is there's at least two kinds of systems. One of them is a mechanical system. It's the, uh, it's the, the clockwork, clock, clockwork universe, you know? It's things that go tick, 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 and one lever moves another lever, another, another lever moves another lever, and we create machines. And that's a system. It's a legitimate system. They're very, very different from living systems. Paul Crafell is out there on the hillside trying to interact with living systems in a way that he feels is important. And that's what we're going to look at today, uh, mechanical and living systems. Paul, from Seeing Nature, which we've done some of his readings, uh, his, his deliberate encounters with the visible world, suggests that there are spirals in nature. Uh, we, he calls them spirals of hope and spirals of despair. We played around with some of his readings on that. And that, for, for, because um, human systems and natural systems are alive and living systems, it gives me a sense of hope that perhaps we can learn to manage them better or at least cause less harm. If all the world was indeed a mechanical system, then we're screwed. We really, we're in trouble because mechanical systems have, have replaceable parts um, and, and uh, there is no magic in a, ma in a mechanical system. Living systems are magic. And small, small sources of change, like one person can make a difference, small sorts of change can spiral upwards and create a, uh, a major effect. And Paul, remember in one of his videos, he said, uh, with this understanding of living systems, I can go from, you know, what can one person do to what can one person do? And that's, for me, a big step to say, we have, a, we, have a play, we have a part to play in this world. What can we do? Remember from Paul the power of erosion. He called it covert convergence, and that was a societal convergence, a natural convergence. And a convergence can be downward, as in erosive cycles of social despair. It can be upward cycles. They, they can converge as well. I want to show you an example of, of what I perceive to be an upward cycle based on the intervention of humans in a natural system um, that cause a spiral of despair, a downward spiral, and actually turn it around in a living system. Um, in a living system. Paul suggested we need to make, take small actions. Um, and those erosive cycles are hard to stop. Those erosive cycles of, of, of violence, of war, of, of, uh, of hunger, of poverty. Um, that we all participate in, they're hard to stop downstream. Um, my metaphor was, you know, I was always at the bottom of the Mississippi River saying, stop the river, you know, because it was going the wrong direction. Paul suggests that we need to do is go way upstream. And he's upstream there, you know, on his hillside, kind of managing the water flow, encouraging the water to infiltrate rather than to run away. This is a picture he took uh, on a dry hillside in 1982 where he put a stone in a dry stream bed. You see this dry stream bed here? And it's moving in this direction, put its stone there, and came back 12 years later, and he's got life. So this is what happens when you intervene in a living system. You can create life. You can encourage life to happen. And Paul did that at his hillside out behind his um, environmental school, and he did this in his, in his dry region and shared this picture uh, on his webpage. And so my metaphor is rather than where I spent much of the 90s, was traveling around the country, flying around the country, telling everybody that's that they need to stop being unsustainable, lecturing to large crowds, telling them they're all bad people, trying to stop the river downstream when it was, you know, where it was, there was too much power. Um, my metaphor is to go upstream and to make the water infiltrate. You know, what Paul says, if we can divert the stream so it doesn't get, create this erosive power way upstream, we can create small rivulets and we have the water can infiltrate, can sink in. And as the water sinks in, the grass starts to grow. And the grass starts to grow, the birds start to come back. And the birds come back, the bugs come back. We've got life, we've got living systems, we've got the emergence of, of, a, uh, of an ecosystem. And I saw this actually happen in uh, Pirinopolis in Brazil, in the Cerrado region of Brazil. This is a, uh, an eco-village. Uh, IPEC is uh, International Permaculture Eco-Village, something or other in, Brazil, in, in Portuguese. Um, but this was, I was there in about 2008. This is a picture of when they first arrived on this hillside in 1998. And this is what they did with permaculture principles in just six years. And, and when I was there, it was even more lush. It was just an amazing place where they used permaculture principles to call, create feedback loops, cycles of hope, by, by, um, by eliminating grazing. This had been overgrazed by using management-intensive grazing, uh, by using water catchments, by, by planting trees, um, and, and, and creating an agroforestry system here uh, in which um, they started to bring back life. When I was there, this was a green lush place in central, in the Sahara, which is a very, very dry region of Brazil. This is where they grow soybeans um, by, you know, thousands of square miles of nothing but soybeans. And, uh, and uh, it's uh, 
pretty much a, a desert, except for soybeans. And this hillside was not worth anything because it had been destroyed. And it wasn't flat enough to grow soybeans. So they bought it for a very little bit of money and brought it back to life. And also brought the social system back to life. They started hiring people from the neighborhood and allowing them to participate in the educational programs free of charge that they were charging our, our folks lots of money for to go down to the eco village. Um, but they were bringing um, local folks in and uh, giving them access, giving them jobs, giving them education. And, and, and there was a number of spin-off businesses that came out of people who had worked in the, in the, in the local village um, outside of Perianopolis, which is a, a large metropolitan area, um, and, uh, and, uh, and sort, of, sort of bring the social system back to life. So I asked the question, you can't, I don't ask the question, I tell you, I don't think you can do this with a mechanical system. There's something, about ma there's something magic in the living system that allows you to, with small changes, create spirals of hope or spirals of despair. Natural systems and living systems are, are natural systems and social systems are living systems because people are part of Mother Nature. And these living systems um, that we have been talking about, um, I believe, can be shifted, can be changed. So here is a video of a four or five minute video of a story of how a natural system was changed with the human intervention of small human intervention that created a cycle. One of the most exciting scientific findings of the past half century has been the discovery of widespread trophic cascades. A trophic cascade is an ecological process which starts at the top of the food chain and tumbles all the way down to the bottom. And the classic example is what happened in the Yellowstone National Park in the United States when wolves were reintroduced in 1995. Now, we, we all know that wolves kill various species of animals, but perhaps we're slightly less aware that they give life to many others. Before the wolves turned up, they'd been absent for 70 years. But the numbers of deer, because there was nothing to hunt them, had built up and built up in the Yellowstone Park. And despite efforts by humans to control them, they'd managed to reduce much of the vegetation there to almost nothing. They'd just grazed it away. But as soon as the wolves arrived, even though they were few in number, they started to have the most remarkable effects. First, of course, they killed some of the deer, but that wasn't the major thing. Much more significantly, they radically changed the behavior of the deer. The deer started avoiding certain parts of the park, the places where they could be trapped most easily, particularly the valleys and the gorges. And immediately, those places started to regenerate. In some areas, the height of the trees quintupled in just six years. Bare valley sides quickly became forests of aspen and willow and cottonwood. And as soon as that happened, the birds started moving in. The number of songbirds and migratory birds started to increase greatly. The number of beavers started to increase because beavers like to, to eat the trees. And beavers, like wolves, are ecosystem engineers. They create niches for other species. And the dams they built in the rivers um, provided habitats for otters and muskrats and ducks and fish and reptiles and amphibians. The wolves killed coyotes and as a result of that, the number of rabbits and mice began to rise, which meant more hawks, more weasels, more foxes, more badgers. Ravens and bald eagles came down to feed on the carrion that the wolves had left. Bears fed on it too, and their population began to rise as well, partly also because there were more berries growing on the regenerating shrubs. And the bears reinforced the impact of the wolves by killing some of the calves of the deer. Here's where it gets really interesting. The wolves changed the behavior of the rivers. They began to meander less. There was less erosion. The channels narrowed. More pools formed. More riffle sections, all of which were great for wildlife habitat. The rivers changed in response to the wolves. 
And the reason was that the regenerating forests stabilized the banks so that they collapsed less often, so that the rivers became more fixed in their course. Similarly, by driving the deer out of some places and the vegetation recovering on the valley sides, there was a soil erosion because the vegetation stabilized that as well. So the wolves, small in number, transform not just the ecosystem of the Yellowstone National Park, this huge area of land, but also its physical geography. complex than one species creating all of this change. The system had to be sensitive to that change, to allow that change to happen, meaning that it had to be a national park. It had to be a place where we weren't farming. It had to be a place where human interventions was minimal. But when the wolves were removed, the herbivores were allowed to disperse, um, uh, denuding the health, the, 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 the size of the rivers, uh, causing the rivers to overflow and, and, uh, and meander and cause more erosion. And when the wolves came back, it changed that how animals interact in that system. This is not the only place that's happened in the world. If you, if you, there's evidence for uh, much of the savanna uh, in Africa, which uh, if you look at the Sahara, the, the, the dry parts, it's actually expanding. And we say that it's expanding largely because of uh, um, uh, over overgrazing of uh, uh, ruminants. Um, that may be part of the story. But the other part of the story is when, when, um, when herbivores are, are, gra are grazing in a savanna, uh, in a natural system where there's, where, there's, um, where there's predators, they graze in a pack. This is what management intensive grazing does, or, or, or um, rotational grazing does. They graze in a pack, which means they, they, they eat everything on the, on the grass. They don't just eat off the uh, preferred herbs, you know, uh, selecting for the, uh, allowing the ones that are, aren't very tasty or very, very useful or nutritious uh, to grow more. Um, by, by keeping herb, um, uh, gazelles, <laughs> zebras, uh, in a pack, um, they will actually move across the landscape and completely eat the grasses, but then move on. And they will dung, and they'll urinate, and they'll re reseed, and they'll move on. And they, they're kept together by, by carnivores. Um, when you remove the carnivores, which is what humans have done, um, the herbivores can then spread out and can completely destroy um, the, uh, the, the grasslands. And that's, what's, you know, that's part of the story in, uh, in the expansion of the Sahara into the savanna regions south of it. Um, and we see this in, uh, in grazing, in grazing um, uh, cattle. Uh, the same thing can happen. You can, you can concentrate them with fencing and move them in controlled matter, or you can allow them to disperse. And what happens over time is they eat off all the preferred um, grasses and the highly nutritional grasses, and the, uh, the less nutritional uh, grasses, can, grass and, and, uh, and broadleaves continue to grow, and what happens is you have a lower quality pasture over time. Um, this is what happened in uh, in Yellowstone, this happens in a lot of places where we don't manage the system using Mother Nature's principles. One of the dangers, I believe, in learning about systems is that they look kind of mechanical. If you look at some of the, the mapping we do, they, they kind of look like a cause and effect, a little bit like a clockwork. You know, this, uh, um, this uh, production drivers of the commodity system, it looks like you push a lever here and something happens over there. It's not that simple. This is a metaphor. This is a, um, a symbolic representation of a much more complex process. But it does include many of the key relationships. Yet the danger, I believe, is it starts to look a bit more, a bit like a clock. What I want to share with you is some thinking about mechanical systems and living systems. The next uh, couple of minutes video is from a movie called uh, Mind Walk. Uh, it was a book by Friedhof Capra, who is a physicist who does a lot of environmental education. Uh, his his uh, book um, was made into a movie, and there's uh, three actors in here. You'll see uh, walking around Mont St. Michael in France. And they're actually just walking around talking about life. I'm going to show you a couple of clips from this video. In the first scene, you're going to find three actors. Jack is a former U.S. Uh, senator and candidate for vice president. He lost. Um, Thomas is a poet and an old college friend of Jack who is uh, more thoughtful and try to help Jack kind of grapple with his uh, grap grapple. Grapple? What is it? Grapple. grapple. Yeah, grapple with his place in the world. Where does he fit in the world? Which is the big question, you know. And Sonia, who's a physicist on leave from her research, questioning the meaning of her work. She's a U.S. citizen that spent some time in France to say, you know, am I, is my work really the kind of work that I really want to do? Uh, and you may recognize some of these uh, actors in this system. The first scene is they walk into a room with an ancient, an ancient a, a medieval clock.
Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. This thing has been functioning for hundreds, hundreds of years. Since before the beginning of modern times. Yeah, but this is different from the kind of time you were talking about before. Sunrise to sunset, Sabbath to Sabbath, isn't it? This is, uh, this is mechanical time. Isn't it? You bet. You bet it is. You bet. I sometimes think that this clock, this machine, is what constitutes humanity's first real break from the world of nature. Wouldn't you say so? Hello? The clock did much more than that. It became the model of the cosmos. And then they mistook the model for the real thing. People got the idea that nature was just a giant clock, not a living organism, but a machine. That's exactly what I've been trying to tell this lunkhead, exactly, word for word. Maybe you recognize him. Jack Edwards, and you're? Uh, Sonia Hoffman. I think I've heard your name somewhere. Yeah, maybe in a couple of hundred news broadcasts. He was a candidate for the U.S. presidency in the primaries. Oh, I vaguely remember. See, I'm not a voter. Most Americans don't vote either. I do know who you are. Me? You know who I am? I doubt it. I... You're Thomas Harriman, the poet. Well, yes, I am, but uh, wait a minute. Let me get this straight. You recognize me, a poet whose latest work sold all of 12,000 copies, but you do not recognize this gentleman who uh, was a presidential candidate in America? My God, woman, what's happened to your values? What do you do? I'm a scientist, and we do occasionally read poetry. As a matter of fact, I'm doing a lot of it these days. I'm on a sort of sabbatical. I'm an ex-physicist, an ex-American resident, an ex voter Ex-wife? This is very upsetting. Why don't intelligent people like yourself bother to poet? Well, forgive me, you politicians make it so hard. Uh, the ideas expressed by most of you, right and left, seem to me as antique and mechanical as that old clock. What's that supposed to mean? Well, if I was to explain that, I'd have to go all the way back to Descartes, if you remember him. Yeah. To be or not to be? I think, therefore, I am. Yeah, well, we both went to college, yeah. Well, Descartes was the primary architect of the view that sees the world as a clock. A mechanistic view that still dominates most of the world today, and it seems to me, especially you politicians. Mechanistic? Is that a real word? Mechanistic? Mechanical? Mechanics? Yeah, it's a good word. Mechanistic, as if nature functions like a clock. You take it apart, reduce it to a number of small, simple pieces, easy to understand, analyze them, put them all back together again, and then you understand the whole. Isn't that what's known as scientific thinking, Miss Hoffman? Really, what you call the mechanistic view, isn't that what the scientific method's all about? Is it? Well, I don't think so, but I'd like to kind of hear from the physicist, Jack. All right, I'm sorry. Please continue. Well... You're right in a way, Mr... Um... Jack. Call me Jack. <laughs> okay, Jack. You are right in a sense. But it wasn't always so. Not before the cult. When he introduced such thinking, it amounted to a revolutionary break with the church. He said, I don't need the Pope to tell me how the world functions. I can find that out for myself. Because to me, the world is just a machine. And then he became fascinated with the clockworks and made a clock into a central metaphor. He said, I consider the human body as nothing but a machine. A healthy man is like a well-made clock. A sick man is like an ill-made clock. Well, the metaphor seems a little clumsy now, but it worked, didn't it? <laughs> yes, so successfully that Scientists came to believe that all living things, plants, animals, us, are nothing but machines. And that's the fallacy. It carried over into everything. Arts, politics. I don't know. It seems to me that most people don't even remember who Descartes was. I'm sorry. I guess I just don't follow you. But he'd like to. If you could just break it down into 30-second media bites, that's more what he's used to. Very funny. All right, what is it that I don't recognize? What's so bad about Descartes? 
But there's nothing bad about the card. In fact, I think the card is wonderful. He was a godsend to the 17th century. But times have changed since then. We need a new way of understanding life. That pendulum, for example, has long since been replaced by a tiny quartz crystal. And these magnificent hand-forged wheels <laughs> turned into a microchip the, the size of my thumbnail. That's how far modern science has left mechanistic thinking behind. But you politicians, you seem to have that clockwork still ticking in your head. We carry this clockwork ticking in our heads and we apply it from a place from a mechanical scientific place or a technology place that allowed someone to create these glasses, which allowed me to see. That's a really good thing. These mechanical systems, mechanical thinking, created my computer, my automobile, the glasses, you know, the lights here. And we apply the same sort of thinking to managing natural systems, however, like that permaculture garden out there. Um, it doesn't work. And that's why I wanted to share you this, 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 this difference between mechanical and living systems. The clock. She says, Sonia says, Lee Oldman says, it was the first break with nature. Prior to the clock, we measured time with perhaps church bells, but mostly with the sunrise and the sunset. This shift in understanding of what, what life was about that came with the clock, you go back into some of the stories and the poetry and the, 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 the stories mostly um, from the period of the 17th century when clocks were installed in church towers. And it changed how people behaved because they no longer got to work eventually, or got up eventually and got on working, they had to be someplace on time because there now was a way of measuring that. And it changed how we, sh how we thought, and it changed how we, we behaved, and it changed our relationship with Mother Nature because we became to understand ourselves as apart from Mother Nature and that we're going to manage these natural systems from outside of it. In this mechanical universe, you can pull a, a heart or a liver or a kidney out of a human being and plop another one in there, and you can, you know, um, and there's, there's shifts, there's changes that happen, it doesn't always work, but it's possible. You know, there's mechanical, um, mechanical health sciences that actually can, can save people's lives. There's also drugs that fix one disease and create others. My little brother um, has a, uh, a chronic disease that he takes a, a medicine, he's been taking it for years, and it gave him cancer, you know? Well, this is interesting, you know, we solved one problem, we created another, because of a living system, we can't quite fix one part without affecting the other parts of a living system. This uh, model of uh, thinking came from Irvin Laszlo. I shared with you earlier in the semester that there was a time on Earth when humans would describe the way their relationship with Mother Earth was described as what he called the mythos. That is, everything is alive. The rocks, the stones, the, li the, the, the clouds, the, the, you know, the, the river system, everything is alive. Somewhere around when the Hebrew Bible was written five, 7,000 years ago, we moved to the era called the Theos. This is the, 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 uh, the religious order in which, which uh, um, God was taken out of the rocks and stones and, 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 uh, and, and clouds and sent off packing to a place we call heaven in the sky, you know, someplace far away. And we had to create a, a, a hierarchical structure to help us intermediate this relationship. We, we call it a priesthood or, a, 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 you know, some kind of a religious hierarchy. That Theos controlled what was right and wrong for many, many years. That Theos was broken by the by Cartesian thinking. Cartesian thinking, the Cartesian worldview, it also was Newtonian physics um, that uh, you know, emerged around the 17th century, that created this clockwork universe, and created what, we, what, what uh, Laszlo called the Logos. That's the scientific revolution. And we praise the scientific revolution, as Sonia says here, because it, it released us from the hegemony of, of, a, of a church that could decide for Galileo that he couldn't stare into the sky um, and, and wonder what, what the universe is all about uh, and allowed um, Aristotle's way of thinking, which was an observation of, the, of, the, of Mother Earth, to uh, be reborn. Um, this is called the Logos. Today, we are controlled by the Logos. This is the scientific revolution that, that allows us to determine what is right and what is wrong. Systems thinking also helps us move into this next, this next era that Laszlo called the Holos. And this is from which um, much of our uh, uh, class was derived from this systems thinking and an understanding of a different way of relating to the earth. If you believe in God, this was a, an area in which, in which God was in all things. Uh, then, of course, God became part of the, the, the sky and mediated by the priesthood. And then, of course, in the logo, science became God. Uh, in the holos, 
we move back to a place where we find a spirit, uh, a God, or a, uh, a power greater than ourselves in all things. We move from God is all things to God is in all things. This is the movement from pantheism that um, is believed to be a heresy to, <laughs> thank you, to panentheism where you find spirit in all things. All things are not, uh, are not uh, God in this, state, in this sense. Um, in the holos, we find something spiritual in everything. Everything we see, everything we do, everything we touch. It's a way of relating to Mother, mother, mother Nature uh, in a different way. And we suggest that this holos uh, can be, we can see ourselves in this, in this uh, relationship with other things uh, as part of this holos. I talked about the holarchy in which um, the myself is part of the family self, is part of the community self. Just as the letter is part of the word, is part of the sentence, just as the atom is part of the cell, is part of the brain, is part of the human, uh, this whole this holarchy or a natural systems hierarchy helps us, helps me understand our, my relationship with Mother Nature. That there is a heart and there is a human. And a, the human is a living system with a subsystem. We call the subsystem the heart. And the human is also a, a living system, and a subsystem is part of another subsystem we call a community, which is part of something bigger than itself. But these relationships are not um, uh, a hierarchy of power and control, but a hierarchy of participation. The Earth is a living system. We call something a living system because it has three characteristics. It's purposeful, it's organized in a particular way that we can understand, and its parts are interrelated in a, in a, in a, in a way that we can begin to affect them, we can manage them. It's a whole. A chicken embryo is a living system. Its purpose is to continue chicken life. It's highly organized in and of itself, and its subsystems are related to each other in particular ways that allow chickens to be born. A chicken embryo is a whole. It's a whole archy. It's a living system. A pile of stuff is not a whole. It's a heap. It's the scientific word for a pile of stuff is heap. We have heaps and holes, and the heap is a pile of stuff it's not terribly purposeful. There may be an outside purpose for putting stuff there, but in and of itself, there is no intrinsic purpose. It's not terribly well organized, except by gravity, uh, and it's not terribly in, interrelated in any kind of a meaningful way. It's a heap. Living systems are much different. And the question I like to ask, this becomes part of your journal question, by the way, or the journal five, is what if we, what if we created um, human systems like farms based on our understanding of Mother Nature? based on living systems, based on these whole what would, what would our farms look like if we use living systems understanding to create food systems? What if Mother Nature provided us with a model rather than the clock providing us with a model of how we should manage farms? The natural systems hierarchy I shared with you earlier, or the whole archy, is organized in a series of, of systems within systems within systems, from the simple to the more complex. And we, we, we can understand this when we think about natural systems, ecosystems. Um, we can understand how that might be managed, understood as a whole archy. Here's a tree. A tree is an organism, right? And normal science, the science that we all learn in high school and college and most of our college courses, normal science will take that tree and take it apart. That, that organism will look at its organ, its cells, its molecules. We'll take apart the parts of the plants. That's how we teach biology today. We teach biology by taking things apart. And that's useful because we understand that their parts are important. System science looks up the whole archy. That is, we start with this tree, which is an organism. And we understand the organism is part of something bigger than itself, like an aspen grove. We believe that aspen grove is the, aspen grove is the largest single organism on the planet because it's interconnected. This aspen, this aspen grove, they're all connected by its root systems. They become one organism. They actually can transfer nutrients. They can transfer growth regular hormones. They can send signals. When a bug starts eating at this end of the, uh, of the, uh, of the, of the grove, the plants can actually send signals to the root systems, to the rest of the growth to say, something's going on here, and they can create defense mechanisms. These are things that, that suggest that there's something at the population level that's important for us to understand if we're going to understand the nature of an aspen tree. A population is part of an ecosystem, much more complex. An ecosystem is part of the planet Earth, much more complex. And perhaps planet Earth is part of the, uh, the, the tree of souls um, from, uh, from uh, what was it? Avatar. 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 Couldn't say it. Avatar, which I love. There was a tree of souls there that allowed people to connect with the other Earth, Mother Earth and each, and each other. And maybe, there's a, maybe that's a larger a hole on in this system. The human body is certainly a living system. We take, we, we, uh, take the human body apart and understand its, its component parts. And that's useful. We're not saying that's, that's bad. What I'm suggesting is it's not complete. A 
complete understanding of the human body would suggest that a human being is part of a family, is part of a community, is part of the earth, is, is part of something bigger than itself. That's how natural systems relate to each other. Uh, the, the component parts relate to each other. And, uh, and mechanical systems do not. A systems thinker would look up to see how that human body fits into the larger family and how their mental health and their emotional health is indeed uh, affecting, perhaps, the physical health. A typical human constructed hierarchy is very different. The first human constructed hierarchy in recorded literature um, was, was Moses crossing the desert, in which 5,000 Hebrews are walking across the desert, and he's got to solve all their problems for them. And his, his father in law, Jethro, suggested that the one should rule the five, the five, five should rule the ten, ten should rule the fifty, fifty should, fifty should rule the many. In, in, in literature, 5,000 years, 7,000 years ago, there's a, there's a human constructed hierarchy that's very different than a natural systems hierarchy. And it's the one we model our military on. Corporations and universities are all modeled as hierarchy. They are relationships, and they're important relations. We need to understand how they work. But in this relationship, power always resides at the top. This is a form of power called power over. Starhawk described this as power over, in which a system of power and control is created so that the people at the top uh, can control those of us at the bottom. In a natural systems hierarchy, the upper levels don't control the lower levels, but they are part. They 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 um uh, they include the lower levels. So we have a hierarchy of inclusion rather than power power over. This is a form of power power with. Natural systems hierarchies, in natural systems hierarchy, power resides at all levels. This is called power with. It's another form of power. And if there wasn't another form of power. Um, we would have a very difficult time thinking about how we're ever going to change the social systems on this planet. As you go up in a human hierarchy, complexity goes down, it gets simpler. As you go up in a natural hi hierarchy, complexity increases. They're very different forms of hierarchy. They're both hierarchies. But when we apply our understanding of a mechanical or a, a, a human system, human constructed hierarchy to that permaculture garden out there, we don't understand it. Natural hierarchies are increasing increasing complexity and increasing inclusion. This is how we understand living systems. What if we then took this understanding and applied to farming systems? That's the homework in the journal, journal five for you. In these relationships, the rule is that we look up, up for purpose, and we look down for function. That is, the purpose of the heart is to serve the human, and the purpose of, and, and the function of the heart, the function of the human is found in the component parts in the, in the heart. And so we look up for purpose to something bigger than ourselves. Um, and we look down for function. If we think about um, the sustainability triangle, well, I'll get to that. The human heart is a subsystem within a larger system. Uh, the heart is a, is a subsystem within a human system. Uh, the human system is, is, a heart, is a subsystem within a, lot, within a larger system. We look up for purpose. The purpose of the heart is to serve the human. The purpose of a human is to serve, serve a larger community, a family or a community, uh, and perhaps to serve the earth. That's how I think about living systems. What I want to do is share with you Sonia's, uh, Lee Volman's understanding, a physicist's understanding of living <laughs> systems, as she talks about um, what it is like to understand a tree by taking it apart and not understanding the relationship of the tree with everything that's bigger than itself. I do think that as long as you continue looking at things, through that old patriarchal Cartesian Atonian lens, you're going to miss out on what the world really is. You, we, all of us, we, we need a new vision of the world and we need a more comprehensive, more inclusive science to support us. There is a new theory emerging now which places all the ecological concepts we've been talking about into one coherent scientific framework. We call it systems theory. The theory of living systems. Living systems? Mm -hmm. All living organisms as well as social systems and ecosystems. See, this theory would help us get a much firmer grasp on the sciences that deal with life. Are these all your own ideas or... Do other people share them? I, I mean, has this been applied in the sciences anywhere? Am I a crank? It's okay, Senator. This is real science. And many scientists, including some Nobel laureates, have been working on these ideas. Prigozhin, Bateson, 
Maturana, just to mention a few. Yes, it is science. But of a new kind. Instead of concentrating on basic building blocks, the system's view concentrates on principles of organization. Instead of cutting things to pieces, it looks at the living system as a whole. How can you think usefully about things in this holistic way? That's what I don't see. You can contemplate them, you can look at them, as Thomas says. But if you want to do something, if you want to get into specifics, by definition, don't you have to take things apart? How can you talk usefully about a tree without talking about its roots or its leaves or its bark? Well, I could. Without even naming the parts you mentioned. A well, Cartesian would look at a tree and conceptually take it to pieces. But then he would never really understand the nature of the tree. A systems thinker would look at a tree and see the seasonal exchange between tree and earth, earth and sky. But see the annual cycle, which really is one big breath the earth takes through its forests, providing us with oxygen. A breath of life, linking the earth with the sky and us with the universe. A systems thinker would look at the tree and see the life of the tree only in relation to the life of the whole forest. Would see the tree as a habitat for birds, a home for insects. But if you look at a tree and and try to understand it as something separate, you will be bewildered by the millions of fruits it's producing in its lifetime. Because only one or two trees will grow from those fruits. So if you look at the tree and see it as a member of a larger living system, that abundance of fruits will make sense. Because hundreds upon hundreds of forest animals and birds will survive because of them. Interdependence. And the tree cannot survive on its own either. To draw water from the ground, it needs the fungus that grows at the tip of each root. And the fungus needs the root to survive, and the root needs the fungus. If one dies, the other dies. And there are millions of relationships like this in our world, each depending on each other for life. The systems theory recognizes this web of relationships as the essence of all living things. Only the uninformed would call such a notion naive or romantic. Because this dependency we all share is a scientific fact. A web of relationships. Yes. But this time it is the web of life itself. Capra's book was called The Web of Life. If you want to learn more about this, it's a, it's a, worthwhile, it's a worthwhile look. So I share this with you as a way of think of, of a new mental model, of a, where a, a pair of glasses that allow us to see the world in its complexity and still figure out, try to think about where do we exist and what is our relationship with the people around us, with the world around us. Or to take off those glasses and continue on our, our, our path of using our reductionist lenses to create computers and automobiles and climate change and social unrest. And all of the other things that, that, that come out of this mechanical way of thinking. The, the moral of the story for me is you have a choice. Uh, that you, you can choose to see yourself as, something, as part of something bigger than yourself and behave in such a way that um, recognizes that we're part of Mother Nature or not, and we all get to make that choice. I believe that one person can make a difference. I believe that because we're part of something bigger than ourselves. I believe that because in one sense, you know, we talk about we're all one. We're all one. Uh, in a particular way, those relationships of how we are all related to each other, I think are really important. The, uh, the idea of saying, yeah, we're all one man and we're all, everything is good, you know, that doesn't help me, but we're all one and we're related to each other in particular ways. Uh, principles of organization, as Sonia talked about, this hierarchy of, of, uh, of living systems begins to help me understand where I exist. That the myself is part of the family self, it's part of the community self. And I can look up for purpose and I can look down for functions. The function of the community is often found in individuals and in individual family units. 
and the purpose for myself is found in something larger than myself. Systems thinking teaches us that small actions, you know, can cause big shifts in consciousness. But that humans are part of nature is a mental model which is um, not well employed in our world today. We perceive ourselves largely apart from nature, other nature, and apart from uh, agricultural ecosystems, and our job is simply to manage them more efficiently. If we were to manage them more, we were to manage that forest more efficiently and look at it as a machine, that tree that produced thousands and thousands of fruit would only produce one or two, because that's all you really need. That's efficiency. But and if, if all that tree is doing is, you know, is, is continue its own life cycle, that's, that's all you need, one or two. But if a tree is part of a population, an ecosystem something larger than itself, then she says, Sonia says, we understand the purpose for millions and millions of fruit that are not, uh, that are not, that don't continue the, uh, the life cycle of that particular species. This works because thoughts create actions. This is where we started the first day. Thoughts create action and actions create thoughts. The mental models affect how we think, how we act, and how we act affects how we, how we, how we see the world. This upward spiral that Crefell talks about only makes sense if you understand the world as a living system. That small, small changes, like reintroducing a wolf to an ecosystem, can actually cause huge impacts uh, because of spirals of change. Because we are all one. And this is my last video for this semester. Um, and it's one of my favorites, that we are all one. Yo, listen up. This is your home. It's the only one you got. This place is pretty, but you can't live there. You can't even get there. So I repeat, this is your home. It's the only one you got. Cherish it, protect it. It's the only one you're going to get. These guys, they're your neighbors. They ain't going away. They ain't leaving. You have to get along with them. So you have to learn to share. You have to get along. You have to learn to get along. Because they are your neighbors. They're not going away. Okay, all this stuff, the animals, the waters, the sky, the ground, the bugs, the fish, the tacos, the people, they're all connected. Everything is connected. They all depend on one another. If you ignore that, you're doomed. Repeat, doomed. Okay, so listen up. It's all one. Not two worlds, not three. One, just one. So get it in gear. Remember, all is one. Okay? Hit it! Get it? <laughs> all right, your homework for uh, Thursday is this uh, Journal 5. Considering the two views of the universe, the clockwork mechanistic view and a living system view, think about how farming might be different under the two world views. Journal article on uh, what would a farm built on a mechanistic mental model look like? What would a farm built on a living system <laughs> mental model look like? And I'll see you on Thursday for this and looking at your own individual learning style. Thanks, folks.